Welcome back to Faith Manifested with Andrea. We're diving back into the word today. Again, this is uh, Judges 11. Watch the words of your mouth, part two. I had to end the previous video um, due to a brief interruption, but I didn't want to use lose that information. So I decided to end the video and do a part two. And we're going to continue back into the word. And we were talking about Jephthah and how he uh, was a brave warrior. It starts out the very first sentence of this chapter. It says he was a brave warrior. And then it continues with, and the son of a prostitute. So if you know anything about even this day and time, but especially back in this time frame when the Bible was written, you know, the son of a prostitute, that was a shunned child. That was a shame child. That child couldn't interact with the other people. You know, the kid, if, if we know how kids were when I was growing up, how they were, you know, they picked on kids. So can you imagine how bad they are now or even how they were back then? But yet he was a brave warrior and he was the son of a prostitute. So it's like he has this great calling on his life, but he has this circumstance that may try to limit him. If he gets wrapped up in that circumstance or that title or that status, it could limit him. So he's a brave warrior, but he has this sort of like hanging over his head. And then on top of that, his brothers, his half brothers, his father's sons, they decided you you don't have any part among us. You're you're not welcome among us, and you're definitely not getting any of our inheritance. And they kicked him out. They basically told him he was worthless. And then the next verse says, And he fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob. Do you see how the enemy would try to attack you to get you away from your calling or get you away from your purpose? He was probably supposed to stay right where he was at. And do all that God told him to do. But the enemy had an attack on his life. Had an agenda on his life. Even though God was saying. I can use you. Who is the son of a prostitute. And it says he ran. He, he ran. And he fled. And he lived in a town. Called Tob. And worthless and unprincipled men. Gathered around him. Why was that? Probably because it's what he felt about himself. He said, well, the good people don't want me. I'll hang around though, the street people. And y'all, a lot of that's how our kids get in games. Because the good people, the ones with the title, and the ones that are supposed to be, you know, the children of God or whatever, they're the ones that treat people the worst. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Thank you, Father. Oh, thank you, Father. 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 So then it says, now it happened after a while that the Ammonites fought against Israel. Who were the Ammonites? The Ammonites were the children of Lot and his daughter. Remember, if you remember back in Genesis, Lot and his wife and his daughters were saved from the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And the wife turned back. She was turned to a pillar of salt. And that God was taking them to a mountain. And Joe, uh, excuse me, Lot... He asked God, could he stay in this city that wasn't too far away? He still was wanting to have connections to that sin, y'all. And it says, 
his daughters thought that all the people around them were destroyed. So they came up with the idea that they would have sex with their father. So each one got their father drunk on a separate night and they slept with them. That would just show, slept with him and they both became pregnant and had children, Ammon and Moab. And these children were born out of incest. These children were born out of the thoughts and things, the mindset of Sodom and Gomorrah. There was more in Sodom and Gomorrah than just homosexuality. They were doing all manner of things. So them daughters had to have seen fathers sleeping with daughters and mothers sleeping with sons and vice versa for them to think that it was okay to sleep with their father. And so the Ammonites came from Ammon. The Moabites came from Moab. And in truth of the nature and truth of the matter, the Israelites and the Ammonites and Moabites, they were cousins because Lot was the nephew of Abraham. And Abraham is who the Israelites descended from. So here we have Jetha who has a call on his life. His brothers are shunning him and treating him bad and they kick him out. He runs and now he's outside of his calling and he's with a group of men that are worthless and unprincipled. Y'all can look around y'all at some of, just some of our men, not saying that, you know, everybody's worthless and unprincipled, but whenever something happens in their lives that shakes them from their calling, that shakes them from their purpose, that they feel like they don't have an identity. Uh-oh. It's like the enemy starts using them for his glory. And then you see them hanging around with other guys like them or other guys that's a reflection of what they feel about themselves. And they're womanizing and they're running the streets together. So that's what Jephthah was doing. And now this enemy is attacking the people. Okay? Sometimes the enemy, God allows the enemy to attack. One, because they turn from God. And two, to get Jephthah back to his calling, to get Jephthah back to his purpose. Now it happened after a while that the Ammonites fought against Israel. And when the Ammonites fought against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to get Jephthah from the land of Tob. So the elders, these are actually, you know, um, the, they're now the leaders of this tribe, the leaders of Israel, right? And they're also Jephthah's brothers. Hmm. What if they had to eat a piece of humble pie? And they said to Jephthah, come and be our leader so that we may fight against the Ammonites. The very man that they ran away, the very man they treated like scum, the very man they said, you, you're not part of us. They now want him to leave. They now want him to risk his life and fight for them. But Jetha said to the elders of Gilead, and this is how you know is his brothers. Did you not hate me and drive me from the house of my father? Why have you come to me now when you are in trouble? He said, wait a minute, you, you said I was nothing. You said that I wasn't going to ever be anything, amount to anything. This is why this, <laughs> watch the words of your mouth. We're going to see the things that they spoke against. Jephthah, how it affected him. And then we're going to see some words that he speaks out of his mouth, how it's going to affect his own daughter. <clears throat> and the, 
<clears throat> excuse me, the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, this is why we have turned to you now, that you may go with us and fight the Ammonites and become head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. <clears throat> excuse me. So Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, if you take me back home and to fight against the Ammonites and the Lord gives them over to me, will I really become your head? He's wanting to be accepted. He's wanting to be loved. He's probably wanting the prestige, the recognition. And he says, if, if I go and fight this for you, will you really make me head? Will you really change how you view me? What you said about me? The elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, the Lord is the witness between us. Be assured that we will do as you have said. They said, God's listening. We can't go back on this word. That's why we have to be careful about the words that we speak out of our mouth because God, angels, and demons are listening to what we say. And we'll be held accountable to the words that we say. So Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead and the people made him head and leader over them. And Jephthah repeated everything that he had promised before the Lord at Mizpah. So he spoke all his words again. Watch the words of your mouth. He's proclaiming his victory. He's proclaiming his leadership. Now Jephthah sent messages to the king of the Ammonites saying, What is the problem between you and me that you have come against me to fight in my land? I like Jephthah. He done went through a lot, right? So he's going to confront the problem head on. He wants to know, why are you fighting me? We need to know who's fighting us and why they're fighting us. I'm not telling you to go out and confront everybody. But you can start going into your prayer room and start praying. Okay, Lord, why am I going through what I'm going through? Who's doing it? Is it me? Is it family that, that's open the door? Ancestors that are open the door? Is it somebody just because of the call of my life, they don't like me? Is it somebody doing witchcraft? Father God, show me what I'm fighting so I know how to fight it properly. <coughs> And he asked him, what is the problem between you and me that you have come against us to fight in our land? And the Ammonites king replied to the messenger of Jephthah, it is because Israel, y'all took away our land when they came up from Egypt, from the river Arnon, as far as the Jabba, east of the Jordan. So now return these lands peacefully. Now, truth of the matter, y'all, the land that they're talking about was actually Amorite territory. So here you have somebody, and this is their, this is cousins. Remember, Ammonites and Israelites were cousins. Now, the Ammonites are saying this land belonged to us and we want it back. And we're fighting you because of it. But the land initially was the Amorite, A-M-O-R-I-T-E, territory when Israel entered and took possession of the land 300 years earlier. That's why I said it's a 300-year grudge. These people fighting over land that didn't even belong to them. But they wanted that territory. Or they're thinking they're mightier and more powerful than the Israelites and that they should have it. That's why I said it's a battle of the gods. Our God versus the little G-O-D-S is the little gods. It's a battle of faith. Even today, y'all, everywhere you look around, is is, is something that's going to pit your faith against somebody else's faith. It's a battle of land. It's a battle of territory. It's a battle of our God, the big G-O-D, versus the little gods, the little G-O-D-S's. 
And it might be a 300-year grudge. You don't even know it might be a 30-year grudge. It might be a 10-year grudge. Or why some people are fighting you just because of what you have. Just because of who you are. Just because of who your God is. Verse 14. But Jephthah sent messengers again to the king of the Ammonites. And they said to him, this is what Jephthah says. Israel did not take the land of Moab or the land of the Ammonites. Because if you remember when they came out of Egypt, God told them not to touch that land. Why? Because even though Moab and Ammon, the Moabites and Ammonites, they were living outside of God's will, but they were still family. They still had a connection to Abraham. So God told them they couldn't touch it, but it was when they started war and stuff that their land was taken later. But this wasn't even their land that they're trying to fight them over. For when they came up from Israel, Israel walked through the wilderness to the Red Sea and came to Kadesh. Then Israel sent messages to the king of Edom saying, please let us pass through your land. But the king of Edom would not listen. Also, they sent word to the king of Moab, but he would not consent. So Israel stayed at Kadesh. So Jephthah sent this messenger back to this king. And he's saying, look, when we came through, we was trying to walk in peace with everybody. We even asked everybody, could we pass through your land? But instead, people came and fought us. Then they went through the wilderness and went around the land of Edom and around the land of Moab and came to the east side of the land of Moab. And they camped on the other side of the river Arna, but they did not enter the territory of Moab. For the Arnon was the northern boundary of Moab. He says, we even went all the way around your land so we wouldn't touch it. Then Israel sent messengers to Sion, king of the Amorites, king of Heshbon. And Israel said to him, please let us pass through your land to our place. So Jeph Jephthah, he's telling this king of the Ammonites everything that occurred. He says, we paid y'all respect because of who y'all were. God told us not to touch y'all. We went all the way around. We detoured around, y'all. We came to the land of the Amorites, and we even asked that king to let us pass, and instead he came out and fought us. But Sion did not trust Israel to pass through his territory. So Sion gathered all his people and camped the Jahaz and fought against Israel. And the Lord God of Israel gave Sion and all his people into the hand of Israel, and they defeated them. So Israel took possession of all the land of the Amorites, the inhabitants of that country. And the Amorites, A-M-O-R-I-T-E-S. They're different from the Ammonites, A-M-M-O-N-I-T-E-S. So Jetha says, we went around y'all land, and we even asked this king of the Amorites, to let us pass and he decided to fight us <clears throat> and God gave us his land our God prevailed our God was bigger than that little God our God was bigger than their little gods and demons they were worshiping so he gave us the land and if you even see right now y'all it's a battle of the words between Jephthah and this Ammonite king Verse 22, they took possession of the territory of the Amorites from the Arnon. So he said, in this land that we got, we fought for it and we, God gave it to us. And it went back as far as the Jabba and from the wilderness westward as far as the Jordan. And now the Lord God of Israel has dispossessed and driven out the Amorites from before his people. Israel, so why should you possess it? He says, wait a minute, we fought for it and God gave it to us. So why should you have it? And then he goes deep. He, he throws a jab at him. Do you not possess what Shemeth, Shemash, excuse me, your God gives you to possess? And everything that the Lord our God dispossessed before us, we will possess. So now, y'all, it's a battle of the gods. It's a battle of the faith. First of all, Jephthah says, we did everything the right way. We never touched y'all borders. We never touched anything of y'all's. We even, even this land that we in right now, we asked the king that was there, could we pass through? And because he decided to fight against us, 
God gave us that land. And he says, so now you're thinking that you're supposed to come here and take this from us? Doesn't your God give you your own land? Doesn't the God that you worship? See, it's a battle of the gods, y'all. It's always this battle of territory. It's about which faith is going to win. Which God is going to prevail. Chemosh was the national deity of the Moabites, whose name most likely meant destroyer, subduer, or fish god. Okay. The goddess Ashtardi was probably the cult partner or his goddess or his female bird of counterpart. Okay. And um Shemash, um, they did human sacrifice to him. And his female goddess, Ashtarchi, is part of the uh, of female worship. The Ashtarchi and the Ashtoreth of what we get Easter. We're gonna see his this this demon god again because later on there's gonna be a king named Solomon who had several wives and some of those wives rebuilt temples or he built temples for this god for his wives and they turned his heart from God. Oh yeah, there's so much to this. It's such, this word is just the it's uh, it's just awesome to me. And we're often taught or believe that Shamosh and Molik are the same God. And this was the God of what they did. Uh, they did child sacrifice. They would turn on this furnace and they would throw the children into the furnace and kill them to have a better life. So Jetha tells him, you know, doesn't your God give you land? Our God gave us this land and you're not taking it. And I'm telling y'all today, God is telling his children, God is, his children to stand up and take the territory. The enemy wants your land. The enemy wants your territory. And land, territory doesn't only mean land. It means your marriages, your spouses, your children, your health, your wealth, your finances. And you need to stand up and tell the enemy, my God has given me this, and you can't have it. In verse 25, Jephthah continues, Now are you in a, any better than Balak, Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab? Did he ever strive against Israel, or did he ever go to war against them? Now, if you remember Balak, he was back in Numbers 21, 22, 23. Balak was, like I said, the Moabite king that came up and he hired a man to curse, to speak curses over the children of Israel. A man named Balaam. Yeah, witchcraft is taught about in the Bible. There's power in your words. Watch your words. But the man named Balaam, every time he went to speak curses over them, he could only speak blessings. Watch the words of your mouth. Verse 26. While Israel lived in Hezbon and its villages and all the cities along the banks of Arnon for 300 years, why did you not recover your lost lands during that time? Jephthah says you've been hating on us for 300 years. You had 300 years to take this land. Why you want to come and fight us now for it? Y'all, I'm telling you, the enemy is attacking you. And it's time for you to stand up and say, wait a minute. Why are you coming now? 
Why are you trying me at this point in time? You cannot have any of my land, my territory, anything God says I'm supposed to have. A 300 year grudge. They've been wanting that land and, and jealous and greed or whatever for 300 years. And, and Jephthah told them, why? You had 300 years. Why did you want to, why you want to come up for it now? Verse 27. So I have not sinned against you, but you are doing us wrong by making war against us. May the Lord a righteous judge. Judge this day between the Israelites and the Ammonites. Y'all, that's a powerful prayer. You got demons, devils, witches, warlocks, whatever coming against you. Ask God to come and intervene and judge the situation. If you haven't done anything wrong to somebody and they're steadily doing something to you, when God comes and judge, that's a dangerous situation for them. It's a dangerous situation for us if we're the ones that's perpetrating against somebody. But the king of the Ammonites disregarded the message of Jephthah when, which he sent to him. So Jephthah gave them a warning. Look, we didn't do anything wrong. I'm praying to God for him to intercede. You have a choice to walk away from this fight or keep fighting it. So Jephthah, he's showing the people. He says, this conflict between Israel and and his neighboring enemies, it didn't even make sense. To somebody just observing, the occupancy of the land of Canaan might simply just be a matter of conquest by the stronger warring nations. So no one could claim the true ownership and land would naturally change hands over the course of history. But for Israel, for God's people, however, possession of the land was the will of God. Your marriage, your spouse, your children, your health, your finances, that's the will of God for the things that you're supposed to have. And this pits the one true God against the false gods of foreign nations who were being dispossessed. There's some witch, warlike, demon, devil somewhere that's thinking that what you have belongs to them. It's a battle of the gods. It's a battle of the big G-O-D-S, G-O-D versus the little G-O-D-S's. It's a battle of faith. Do you know what God says you're supposed to have? Are you going to fight for what God says you're supposed to have? These other nations understandably did not see things Israel's way because they did not recognize the sovereignty of Israel's God. They didn't recognize God Almighty. And so people are attacking you right now and don't understand the God that you serve, the God that you love, the God that loves you. And they might have felt just as strongly about their own gods. And that their gods will for them was to possess the land in question. Therefore, the struggle for land was not just the result of greed or even the basic desire to secure a home and country. It was interwoven in the fabric of faith our god says we're supposed to have this a non-negotiable element of one's religion or in israel's case faith in the one true god whom they frequently neglected or abandoned to their own destruction God said he would give them everything. And yet they chose to follow the lesser gods. God today will still give us everything. He says it's written in your promises. He's written, it's written in your covenant. It's written in his word. But we still often can choose to follow the lesser G-O-D-S. Time to take your territory. We're almost finished with this chapter. Now we're going to see, we saw at the beginning of this book or this chapter that Jephthah's brothers, he was a brave warrior, but he was the son of a prostitute. So he had some shame on his head. And then his brothers deepened the blow and they kicked him out and said, you're worthless, you're no part of us. They were speaking words over him, probably even speaking curses over him. 
Watch the words of your mouth. The words that they spoke over him caused him to run from his destiny. Caused him to hang around. It says a worthless and unprincipled group of people. And the talents and stuff that he was supposed to have been using for God, he was using for the enemy, raiding people. And then God says, I'm still going to use him. I still can use him. No matter the situation or circumstance, your call is there unless you completely just walk out of that call. I might send some situation that will pull you back into that call. And so then J uh, Jetha is uh, confronted, approached by his brothers, come back and fight for us. And now he's fighting for them. But he still has some hang-ups probably because of what he had been through. Watch the words of your mouth. So verse 29 says, Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and he passed through Gilead and Manasseh and Mitzvah of Gilead. And from Mitzvah of Gilead, he passed on to the Ammonites. So he starts going, going for war, going to the battle. And as he going, he said, watch the words out of his mouth, y'all. He made a vow to the Lord and said, if you will indeed give me the Ammonites into my hand. Why is he making con conditions with God? Then whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the Ammonites, it shall be the Lord's and I will offer it up to you as a burnt offering. That was idle words, foolish words. What exactly did he think would come out of his house? Did he think an ox or a sheep or a goat was going to run out of his door? Did God ever tell people to make vows like that to him? God says, you get up and go. If I called you, I'm going to give you the victory. Then Jephthah crossed over to the Ammonites to fight with them. And the Lord gave them into his hand. And from Aurora to the entrance of Mena, he struck them 20 cities. And as far as Abel Karamah, brook by the vineyard, with a very great defeat. So the Ammonites were subdued and humbled before the Israelites. Y'all, when God fights for you, all your enemies are supposed to be subdued and humbled before you. And now those words are going to come back and bite Jephthah in his behind, as they say. Watch the words of your mouth. Then Jephthah came to his house at Mizpah, and to, this is what he saw. What did he think would be the first thing that come out of his house? His daughter coming out to meet him with tambourines and with dancing. And she was his only child. Except for her, he had no son or daughter. Uh-oh. And when he saw her, he tore his clothes in grief and said, Alas, my daughter, you have brought me great disaster. And you are the cause of my ruin, ruin to me. For I have made a vow to the Lord and I cannot take it back. He says, I have opened my mouth wide. I've made this tragic vow. And this tragic vow reveals the folly and danger of making such a deal with God. God never told him to make those type of deals. As though a mere human could really offer God something of value. As an incentive or bribe for his help. Y'all, that's what the pagan people do. They give their gods incentives and bribes, you know, so that those demons will work for them. God says, I give everything. You don't have to bribe me. I give to you because I want to. I chose you. And his daughter says to him in verse 36, my father, you have made a vow to the Lord. Do to me as you have vowed. Since the Lord has taken avenge, taken vengeance for you on your enemies, the Ammonites. And she said to her father, let this one thing be done to me, for me. Let me alone for two months so that I may go to the mountains and weep over my virginity. Weep over the future that I'm losing. Weep over me not getting married and having children and living a blessed old life. She says, let me and my companions go and weep. The words he spoke canceled out his daughter's future. 
What words are you speaking out of your mouth right now that's canceling your future, canceling your spouse's future, canceling your children's future, canceling your marriage, canceling your healing, canceling... The words that were spoken over Jephthah changed his life. And the words he spoke over his daughters, over his daughter, changed her life. What words are you speaking out of your mouth? Watch the words out of your mouth. At the end of two months, she returned to her father who did to her just as he had vowed. And she had no relations with a man and it became custom in Israel. That the daughters of Israel went yearly to tell the story of the daughter of Jepha, the Gileadite, four days in the year. So it became like a um, holiday that they would that they would um, honor. That's sad, y'all. That's so sad. And that um. Ceremony is still performed today. That's so sad. Why are the words that you're speaking out of your mouth? He canceled out his own daughter's future. Help his father. And I'll tell you like this. God did not make that holiday. <laughs> or God did not make that holy day. I don't celebrate July 4th. I don't celebrate a lot of other holidays as well. Because as you see, this was a man-made holiday. This was a man-made holy day. Okay. God didn't tell them to make that holiday. But that holiday is still celebrated in Ju in Israel to this day. Help us, Father. We have fallen some so far away from God's word. With well, that finished, Judges eleven. It's a lot within that chapter. Watch the words of your mouth. The battle of the big G-O-D versus the little G-O-D-S's. The battle of faiths. The battle for territory. 300-year grudge. Some people have a five-year grudge against you. Mm. Help us, Father. Help us, Father. Let's pray. Father God, right now, we just want to say thank you. Thank you for this precious word. Thank you for this precious word. Father God, we thank you right now that no matter the situation we were born in, no matter the name or the labels people have tried to give us, we are what or who you say we are. And the purposes and the calls upon our life will be fulfilled. Father God, every negative word that someone has spoken over us, our spouses, our children, our futures, our purposes, our destinies, our health, our wealth, our lives, our marriages, anything that you said we're supposed to have, anything that's speaking against it, we nullify it today in the name of Jesus. We negate it, negate it today in the name of Jesus. Father God, we ask right now to forgive us for any words that we've said in error idle words against ourselves, our spouse, our children, or anyone else that we've spoken to curse and not bless. Forgive us on today, Lord. We renounce those words. We cut ties with any of those words. We place those words under the blood of Jesus. Mm. Father God, Expose the nature of what's fighting us, who's fighting us, and why they're fighting us. If there's a 300-year grudge, a 30-year grudge, a 3-year grudge, a 3-minute grudge, Father God, 
let it be exposed. And let Father God be the judge between us and our enemies. Show us, Father God, if we've done something wrong against our enemies so that we can ask for forgiveness and put it under the blood of Jesus. Show their, our enemies what they've done wrong so they can put it under the blood of Jesus and come back to you, Lord, before it's too late. Father God, let us walk in our destinies, our purposes, our callings. We will be all that you say we will be. We will do all that you say we will do. Father God, forgive us if our words, our careless words, our, the words that out of our mouth have canceled out somebody's future. Our children, Lord, whatever. We forgive us on today. We renounce it right now. The opposite shall happen. Every negative word, let it turn to a positive word. Every curse word be turned, every curse turned to a blessing on today in the name of Jesus. Father God, enlarge our mouths over the mouths of our enemies. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. You are our God. Let the negative words that have been spoken against us, our spouses, and our families be nullified in the name of Jesus. Psalm 101 and 5 says, Whoever secretly slanders his neighbors, him you will shame, Father God. That's your word. Defend and protect us. Whatever has been spoken in secret and in the open concerning us to curse us for evil, let it be negated. And the potency of that word be revoked. And let the vehicle through which that word is coming be arrested and counseled permanently in the name of Jesus. Proverbs 18 and 21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat the fruit thereof. Father, we speak life and not death, blessings and not curses. Let us eat the fruit of the positive words and blessings we speak. Negate and nullify, nullify every curse and negative word we have spoken over ourselves, our spouses, our children, our destinies, our purposes. Nullify and negate any negative words or curses spoken over us now in the name of Jesus. Anything spoken from this day, back from birth, Father God, in the name of Jesus. Many are saying there's no help. No salvation for us. We have been written off. Death and loss have been spoken over us. Father God, I know every negative word right now spoken against us in the name of Jesus. We declare the opposite shall occur over every negative word and curse spoken over us in the name of Jesus. We revoke the potency of every negative word spoken against us in our family. In the name of Jesus. We revoke those words and curses now. Everyone that wants to see us crying over our spouses and our children and our family and our loved ones will see us rejoice over them. Father, prepare a table for us in the presence of our enemies and let them see the blessings, favor, and protection you have prepared and reserved for us, your children. Put a new song in our mouths and a hymn of praise to our God on our lips. Let those who say, aha, aha, be appalled at their own shame. And we say we thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Watch the words of your mouth. We're going to shift gears for a moment. But just know, God wants us to be careful with the words that we speak out of our mouths. Words are powerful things. God's words were so powerful that they actually created everything. Go back to Genesis 1. Even the words of us humans can do powerful things. Solomon wrote in Proverbs 18 and 21 that death and life are in the power of the tongue. The power of life and death can be seen in jury trials where witnesses and jury members can speak words that might literally determine whether a defendant lives or dies. less extreme but no less more real are the power of encouraging words to give hope and joy and the power of discouraging words to spark dismay and depression look at the words that were spoken over Jephthah's life by his brothers and how it affected him Jesus tells us I tell you that everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken Matthew 12 and 36 that translates every empty word as every idle word, every careless word, 
Look at what Jephthah did with his careless words, his careless vow, how it took his daughter's future. The Greek phrase is rema, argos, meaning careless or inactive or unprofitable words. In context, Jesus also contrasting the good things within a good person with the evil things in the heart of an evil person. We are admonished to make the best use of our words because words express what is in our hearts. The mouth speaks what the heart is full of. What is coming out of your mouth? Watch the words of your mouth. As we pray these prayers, do you cancel out what we pray? I'm dying. This is killing me. I'm sick and tired. I'm broke. I'm busted and disgusted. She'll never amount to anything. He'll never be anything but more like his dad. What words have you spoken out of your mouth? Watch the words of your mouth. And please understand that the words of your mouth will show your spiritual gauge. It will gauge your spiritual condition. For by your words, you will be acquitted. And by your words, you will be condemned. Jesus was speaking to a group of Pharisees who had accused Jesus of being demon-possessed. Verse 24, Jesus calls them a brood of vipers and asked them, how can you who are evil say anything good? And y'all, he was talking to the church folk because the Pharisees were the preachers and priests. Uh-oh. But they were in religion and not relationship with God. Just as vipers have a mouthful of poison, so the Pharisees had evil words concerning the Savior. Then Jesus warns the Pharisees of the coming judgment at which they will be held accountable for their words. There is no better judge of a person's heart than the words he allows to come forth from his mouth. Watch the words from your mouth. Why? Because it's showing you the content of your heart. I used to cuss, use profanity. And when I read that scripture, I said, is that in my heart? That nasty, foul stuff? I used to cuss like a sailor. But when I read that scripture, I said, no, I do not want that nastiness, that filthiness in my heart. And that prompted me to let God really work on my heart and work on me so that that would not come out of my mouth. Those that use a lot of profane words, a lot of nasty words and filthy talk, that's showing them the condition of their heart. Those that complain and moan and groan a lot, that's showing you the condition of your heart. Even with me taking care of my husband and all that we go through, you're not going to hear me do too much moaning, and groaning or complaining. Why? Because my heart says, God got this. There is no better judge of a person's heart than the words he allows to come forth from his mouth. Just like good trees produce good fruit and bad trees produce bad fruit, so does the mouth reveal the heart's condition. condition verse 33. But it's not just evil words for which people must give account. And evil words, y'all, include profane words, but it also includes curse words, as in um, people speaking curses. I speak death over you. I speak failure over you. I speak, that's curse words as well. And that's showing you the condition of that person's heart. People that do witchcraft, voodoo, santeria, juju, whatever, you go to them and say, well, I want this man. And then they start giving you incantations and things to speak or things to do. That's showing you that person's heart is demonic. Jesus said also, Every careless or idle word can be used as judgment against the speaker. Look how Jephthah's words came back to judge him. Even the slightest sin, the smallest deviation from God's perfection will condemn a person in God's eyes. Thank God for the blood of Jesus, y'all. That's why we have to confess our sins before him, before God, and put these things under the blood of Jesus. That's why I pray those prayers about negative words. Whether we spoke on someone else, we counsel them by the blood of Jesus. The Pharisees' sin was great. They had blasphemed the Lord with God of glory with their words. But even seemingly insignificant words, sometimes excused as, as clips of the tongue, are considered sinful. They do not bring glory to God. 
people say excuse my french that's not french that word that you just said and how is a child of god using profanity gonna glorify god i was watching uh, what i thought was a christian movie last night but it was so much profanity in it i'm like what is this mess disguised as in the, the name of the movie was no weapon shall prosper at the very end it showed it was a preacher in it and it was some pre somebody praying but all the content in before it like what in the world ephesians 4 and 29 says do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths but only only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen. Be careful with gossiping. James 3 and 8 advises on how hard it is to control the tongue. No human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Then in James 4, 11 and 12, brothers and sisters do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There's only one lawgiver and judge the one who was able to save and destroy it. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? Be careful with gossiping. Given the weighty consequences of our words, we saw this with Jephthah, y'all. Even our careless ones, we must learn to yield our bodies, members, including our tongues, to the control of the Holy Spirit. That's the only one that can really tame the Lord, tame the tongue, sorry. Set a guard over our mouths, O Lord. Keep watch over the door of our lips, O God. As Psalm 141 and 3 says. Thank you, Father. I got a little bit more time. I know this is like a part two. But I want to go back into the spiritual warfare that shattered demonic altars. And household witchcraft book by Robin Denonoff. And we're in the introduction section. And it says, you have personally felt the onslaught of satanic attack in your life. We saw satanic attack in Jephthah's life, y'all, believe it or not. Have you struggled with addiction of some kind? Have you struggled with depression or discouragement? Look how it, you know what, that satanic attack against his life, when his brothers kicked him out, how it changed his whole course of events for a while. Have you struggled with anger or problems in your marriage? Have you felt that you are not saved or that God doesn't love you? That is all a supernatural attack orchestrated by Satan. This is warfare. But God has given us the protection we all need. The Bible says in Ephesians 6 and 10, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Because we struggle against God's enemy, we must walk in God's strength. Y'all, you can't fight this battle on your own. The things I've been fighting in my life, at one point, I tried to fight it on my own, but when things got too heavy, I had to go to God. I've told y'all my story about whenever I found out my husband had an affair and there was a child produced. I couldn't fight that in my own. In my own, my flesh said, kill him, kill her. <laughs> Problem solved. But God said, you pray for them. You pray for her, you pray for the child, you pray for your spouse. You let me do the work. You let me be the judge. You just pray. And because I did warfare by his standards, he blessed me and he kept me in my right mind. He promoted me and elevated me. And guess what, y'all? That was a serious attack by the enemy like Jephtha, to get me from my calling, to get me from my purpose. But when you walk with God, y'all, it will propel you into your destiny, propel you into your purpose. And I can be on this video today teaching you the word of God, learning the word of God with you, and teaching you spiritual warfare as we fight together. I love the word of God, y'all, because in the Bible, you will find yourself. Imagine me dealing with my husband having an outside child and then here's Jephthah who was mistreated because he was an outside child. So how could you read that and then mistreat a child? Do y'all hear me? 
And because I read this word, that got in my heart and it was able for me to love on that baby and love on that child. Because the situation was messed up, the situation was scandalous, but the child wasn't. I grew up where my father had an outside child. And that child was never allowed at my house. There's many people, there's a lot of people out there, where I'm from in North Carolina, they have outside children. And the outside children are treated with that shame and that disgrace. And they're not allowed to be around their brothers and sisters. And it's a big secret and nobody knows, but everybody knows. And I remember my brother was probably about 20 some years old. I was around the same, you know, a couple of years older than him. And it was me, my dad, and my two sisters. And we were out together. And he was there. And I remember him as a, you know, I was thinking of him as, you know, a grown man. And he said, I finally belong. And that sat deeply on my heart, y'all. And that situation occurred like a whole year not even a year, I think about three months before I found out my husband had an affair and had a baby on the way. But God was putting the things in place so I would be able to walk through that situation as a woman of God and so that I would be able to do warfare the right way. Because in my flesh, I could have told that child she was not welcome here. I could have told my husband never would that child be around us and our kids. But instead, God was able to allow me to open my heart and my home to this baby and show her love. When I look at Jephthah, I also look at my husband and how he had such a call on his life, but yet people around him told him he was worthless, he was nothing. And for some time frame, he felt that way. And you can see how, the, you know, some of the people that was around him and how him and those around him were completely out of the will of God for their lives. And when my husband first got sick, I remember telling his friends, I said, let me tell y'all this. Y'all used to run the streets with my husband the wrong way. I said, but when he get out of this bed, y'all going to run the streets with him again, but it's going to be the right way. Y'all going to be the mighty men of valor that God called you to be. And God, of course, is going to be that warrior that God always said he was from the beginning. And so when I look at Jephthah's story and I see what he went through because of the words that were spoken over him. But yet he went through that tough situation and yet he came out to be the warrior that God always said he was from the beginning. I don't know about y'all, but I can see me in this stories. I can see me, my, myself in these accounts, recounts of events. And y'all, this is warfare. This is warfare. So I couldn't fight that situation in my own strength. But because we struggle against God's enemy, we must walk in God's strength. The discomforting thing about our spiritual warfare is that we are terribly overmatched. With my husband dying twice, dying for 13 minutes and dying for 18 minutes, I was overmatched. But God and me are the majority. Fast and prayer, pr pr praying, praise and worship, speaking the word of God. Those are the, the, the uh, weapons he's given us. Through that situation, through this situation, God has sh uh, shown me how to become experts with these we uh, weapons. Be careful not to be presumptuous and think that you can beat the devil in this war. You got to look at the battles that the Israelites won, y'all. Gideon fought 300 men with 300 men versus 120,000 soldiers. How could they have even begun to win that battle? But with God, all things are possible. God gives us the victory. You can't even really win over one of his subordinates. This is why we are exhorted to be strong in the Lord in the strength of his might. The order here is clear. We are first to be strong in the Lord, 
Get your relationship with God right first before you try to do any type of spiritual warfare. Start walking according to his word. Ask him to show you anything in you that's of the enemy, anything in your life, and it is time to get rid of it. You got to do warfare the right way. Our focus must always be first on Jesus, on God. We must cultivate our relationship with him. And until we have taken care of that, nothing else will do. Spiritual warfare 101, relationship with God. Are you saved? Have you renewed your relationship with God? Have you told God today, Lord, I'm your child. You are my daddy. You are my father, God. I accept your son. Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. I want my relationship with you the way it's supposed to be. I have confessed my sins and I place them under the blood of Jesus. I walk back in covenant with you, Lord. You are my God and I'm your people. It's time to cultivate your personal relationship with Jesus. Then you'll be able to operate in the strength of his might. The power of God comes from a relationship with God. We will only be able to face the challenges of spiritual warfare we fight if we are filled with God's strength. You can't do what you're fighting on your own. I'm telling you, if I would have done it on my own, I would be dead in jail or in a crazy house. Fighting with seeing my husband recover. If I did this in my flesh, I might well have a side dude or a side boyfriend. I might would have done things for money when our money situation got low. The people that said hurtful things, the people that turned their backs on us, I might would hate them or be unforgiving or have some bitterness toward them. But when I do this in God's strength and my, my relationship with him, I can still smile. I still have joy. I have the peace that surpasses all understanding. I can pray. I can still laugh. I can still... Do you hear me? What are you going through that you need God's strength for your fight? Isaiah 40 and 31 says, But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Are you growing weary? Are you walking and not faint and about to faint? I've been in this fight with my husband for three years. I could have fainted by now. The situation with the baby from 2006 to 2019, that's 13 years. I had to walk in my own in God's strength. We read, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. The idea expressed in this passage is that those of us who wait upon the Lord will exchange our strength for his. And I remember when my brother was with us at that uh, uh little who was at a club truthfully <laughs> it was me my sisters my dad and he said i feel like i really belong now i feel like i really belong and that tugged on my heartstrings to see a 21 year old man say something like that and how it had affected his situation had affected his life the title placed on him because my father had an affair, because his mother had an affair with a married man that produced a child. So that placed on my heart so that when I went through the situation, I could not treat that child differently. But I had to, I'm telling y'all, I had to walk in the strength of God when her mother would send pictures to the house every month, updating my husband on her growth and progress. And that knife that had tried to be placed in my heart was twisted. I had to walk in my own strength. When there were phone calls, 
updating that she's now walking or she said her first words and the scab was picked off again. I had to walk in the strength of God. This is what we must have if we, have, if we are to fight successfully. Our protection is God's armor. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Throughout this paragraph on spiritual warfare, Paul's sustained imagery is drawn from the prophecy of Isaiah, which describes the armor of God, the armor of Yahweh and his Messiah. Isaiah 11 and 4 says, and I'm almost finished, but with righteousness he would judge the needy. With justice he would give decisions for the poor of the earth. He would strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, with the breath of his lips, he would slay the wicked. These references in Isaiah depict the, depict the Lord of hosts as a warrior dressed for battle as he goes forth to vindicate his people. Do you hear that? The full armor of God, which the readers are urged to put on as they engage in a daily spiritual warfare. So Isaiah and New Testament both speak about the armor of God. So why do we think that we don't have to fight? Why do we think we don't have to put on the armor of God and go to war? The full armor of God, which the readers are urged to put on as they engage in daily spiritual warfare, is Yahweh's own armor, which he and his Messiah Messiah have worn and which is now provided for his people as they engage in battle. He's giving you what you need for your battle. Not only must we walk in God's strength, we must put on God's armor. The armor of God, which we will address later, is our protection. We must put on the full armor of God for a very important reason. This armor will enable us to be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. What? Did you not know that your enemy is making plans against you? Did you not know that your enemy is studying you, planning how to take you down, your spouse down, your children down? And yet you won't get up and pray, won't get up and fast, won't listen to this video? Won't read the word of God? Yeah, we come under the blood and protection of Jesus through relationship and covenant. Put on the armor of God and go to battle. Please understand Satan is not simply sitting idly by. Neither is he randomly going about his work. He is not only ultimate evil, he is ultimate evil with a plan. And Satan has many schemes. He is organized and prepared to discourage and frustrate every effort we might undertake for Jesus. Let me tell y'all something about the schemes of the devil. And I'm going to finish. July 2017. I did a, like a 14-day fast. And I stood in the kitchen. And God showed me every attack on my life from a child. The things that wanted me to be depressed, suicidal. Where someone molested me or tried to molest me. Or there was an attempted rape. Or there was an abusive relationship. How the various things the enemy sent towards me. To get me from my purpose. To diminish the light that God placed in me. So at 18 I fell in love. And I went into a uh, my first sexual relationship. And my life spiraled out of control. And I dreamed of demons around my bed saying we finally got you. And I had my first child. <coughs> I was wedded in a Muslim ceremony. Uh-oh. It's a lot to my story, y'all. And then I found out that that spouse had cheated on me and had a baby. Uh-oh. And it literally almost destroyed me. It literally, I was thinking I needed to kill myself. I wasn't in God at that point in time. I wasn't going to church. And I literally almost did not survive that situation. 
That was back in 1997. I got out of that relationship. I met my husband. And fast forward to 2006. Here's the replay of that whole scenario again. The devil had watched me and he saw that it almost worked the first time. So he says, well, the second go round, this will probably really work. But at this point in time, I had begun to listen to God. I had begun to walk with him. And instead of letting that situation pull me away from God, it pushed me toward him even more. So yes, we have an enemy that has plans. He is an intelligent being and he is out to kill and destroy. The devil wanted me dead. And he has tried on several occasions to kill me. How do we combat his plans? How do we stand against his schemes? Y'all, what I learned from that situation in 2006, we must be clothed in the armor of God. Only God can protect us. Only God can empower us. The right armor and the right weapons must come from God. We cannot fight with our own weapons and we cannot leave ourselves exposed to his attacks. At the same time, a number of concerns within the whole letter are brought back to the reader's attention in an emphatic way. There's a recapitulation of various issues, themes, and terminology from the earlier sections of Paul's letter. For example, the encouragement to be strong brings to mind God's power, which was manifested in Christ's resurrection. And exaltation is now available to believers. The same way God's power, y'all, that's why you got to get in the word of God and know what he said, because the same way God rose Christ from the dead, every dead situation in your life, he can bring life to. Ephesians 1 and 19 says, and his incomparably great power for us who believe the power is the same as the mighty strength. It's a battle of the big G-O-D versus the little G-O-D-S's. It's a battle of faith. God wants to empower us, y'all, and he even strengthens us with the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 3 and 16 states, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with the power through his spirit in your inner being and the praise that God's power is at work among them. Ephesians 3 and 20 adds, now to him who was able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. We need the Holy Spirit, y'all. So spiritual warfare, what? We start with relationship with God. From there, we put on the armor of God. We ask for the Holy Spirit. He gives us that. And then we go to war. And he will train us for battle. He'll show us what's battling us and how to battle it properly. I was having dreams, y'all. During this whole time frame of my husband having an affair of this woman fighting me, of, of, of a big bull charging at me, a, a raging red horse charging at me, not knowing that I had a real enemy that hated me. I didn't understand what God was showing me in the dreams. But now as I dream stuff, God, I know without a doubt what God is showing me. Y'all, we must clothe ourselves with the armor of truth, righteousness, the gospel, faith, salvation, and the sword of the spirit. Only then will we be prepared to stand against Satan and his schemes. Our prize is God's victory. Therefore, take up the full armor of God that you may be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand, stand firm. I'm telling you, I'm standing here today because of why I went back to my relationship with God. I put on the armor of God. I was able to resist what the devil was throwing at me. And having done everything, be able to stand firm. Not only must we walk in God's strength and put on God's armor, but we also must stand in God's victory. 
God is not calling us to be wimps, but to be warriors. And we don't battle from a losing position. We battle from victory. And I call it to stand firm. Now that we have appropriated God's strength and put on God's armor, we may stand in victory, which is ours in Christ Jesus. It's per your covenant agreement. The real power connected with the piece of armor in Ephesians 6, 14 to 17 have already been presented in earlier chapters of the epistles. So we have truth. Ephesians 1 and 13 says, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believe you were marked in him with, with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. Almost finished y'all. In the C.S. Lewis book, The Screw Tape Letters, there's actually a YouTube video on that. A senior devil named Screwtape is instructing a junior devil on how to tempt and trap humans. Y'all, that's a very interesting book. I've heard some of it um, on YouTube. I haven't read the book. It may be something that we may go over. I may purchase it and go over it, one of our future books of the month. But he says, one of our great allies at present is the church itself. He says, do not misunderstand me. I do not mean the church as we see her spread out through all time and space and rooted in eternity, terrible as an army with banners. That I confess is a spectacle which makes our boldest tempters uneasy. But fortunately, it is quite invisible to these humans. We must understand the power of the risen Lord in his true church. I gave a message on the other day about a dream that I had about these people kidnapping me and putting me in the scanner and they said and a red cross showed and they says oh no she's a real one the real ones y'all have the power and authority to tear down the enemy's kingdom but this fake fruitful churchy mess y'all will not cut it going to church on sundays and then going back to steve's house on monday that's not gonna cut it any longer that going to prayer meeting on Wednesday and then hating uh, Billy and Sue and Jill Monday through Friday is no longer going to cut it. We must ask God to help us see the invisible. The army of God is truly on the march and you are a part of that army. You are part of the true church and we must stand firm. Let Satan do his worst. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can't endure. For lo, his doom is sure. We are privileged to stand in the victory of Christ. So take courage. Fight the fight of faith. Although the enemy is armed and danger, dangerous, so are we. I'm sorry, I don't do wimpy messages, y'all. It's time for warrior status. And we also have all the mighty angelic warriors battling for us, y'all. This is a win-win situation no matter what we face. I'm going to finish this section and we'll close out. From heaven's fortress, the mighty armies of the Lord of hosts arrays themselves for battle. These angelic warriors with their flashing swords and brilliant army armors surge forth in battle array against the host of hell. Do you believe that God has angels fighting for you? If you can't believe that, then why believe the Bible? Because it's in the Bible that he sent his angels out to fight. Even angels minister to Jesus. As the army of God's church on earth falls to his knees and as the prayers of the saints ascend heavenward, the battle is engaged. Y'all, this is spiritual warfare. There's a lot that you can take down with your prayers, with your fasting, with your speaking the word of God. The struggle ensues. One foe after another is pierced through by the awesome power of our mighty God. These invisible supernatural creatures groan in intense struggle with the souls of men and women hanging in the balance. But God's word is sure. The gates of hell absorb blow after crushing blow as the mighty weapon of God's soldiers burst upon it. First the gates are hit just a little bit. They're buffeted a little bit. Then they begin to groan under the mighty surge. And finally they crumble under the onslaught of the army of God. 
God told us in his word that he'll give us the gates of our enemies. Because when we have the gates of our enemy, we can take whatever of theirs that we want, whatever of ours that was taken, we can take it back. It is the church, the terrible as an army with banners. This is our destiny. Marcus Rogers, uh, a YouTube minister, he says, casual Christians will be casualties of war. The real ones will make a difference. The shout of victory fills the air. All hail King Jesus. All hail Emmanuel, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, bright and morning star. Through all eternity, we'll sing your praises and we'll reign with you throughout eternity. Remember this, the church is armed and danger, dangerous. You should be armed and dangerous. And we're going to go through this book, y'all, and learn the weapons of warfare and break every evil altar set up against us in our, our households. So this book is a little bit uh, di different. It's going to tell us some more specific uh, weapons that the enemy uses against us. And one of those is altars, evil altars. And as we continue to study the book of Judges and um, through other books of the Bible, we'll see where God told them to tear down the evil altars and build God altars. And in this book here, we'll see the significance of why God told them to do that. So as we close out today, I want to tell you, keep praying, keep pressing, keep reading the word, keep speaking the word, keep believing. You are doing damage to the gates of hell and Satan's army. And you are mightier than you think. You are not what the enemy says you are. You are not what the attack of the enemy has tried to do to you. But you are what God has destined and purpose and called you to be do. Be and do. Father God, we thank you for this word. We thank you for this book. Take us deeper in it. Take us into the deeper dimensions of you, Father God. Help us to understand this book and your word. Give us a greater knowledge and understanding. Father God, today we want to renew our relationship with you. We want to accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We want to say once again, you are our God and we're your people. Forgive us, Lord, for anything that we, anytime we've said or did things that showed you that we rebuke, we we we, we uh, rebelled against you. Wash us in the blood of Jesus on today. Establish, reestablish your covenant with us today, God. You are the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You are our God, and we're your people. Teach us how to fight. We put on the armor, of God. Fill us with the Holy Spirit, and show us what is fighting us. Who is fighting us and how to fight in the right way. You have already given us a victory, Lord. So we fight from victory. Expose every work, every evil device, every scheme of the devil in our lives. Use us, Father God. Let our light shine brighter. Let our stars take the rightful places. Bless us, Lord. Keep us, Lord. Provide for us, Lord. Protect us, Lord. Fight for us, Lord. You are our God and we're your people. And that settles it all. We love you, oh God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, join me tomorrow. We will probably do uh, Judges 12. And we might hit into 13, but Judges 12 is going to tell the people that came after Jephthah. Judges 13, we get the meat Samson. Somebody say, oh, Samson, my Lord. Mm -mm -mm. Samson is going to be in Judges 13, 14, and 15. And y'all, there's a lot and 16. <laughs> Uh, there's a lot, a lot, a lot we're going to learn about Samson. And it, uh, it uh, it's a lot. And Samson had a wife. He had a prostitute. He had um, 
<laughs> he had Delilah. And he had a call on his life. He was a child of promise. So we're going to see what happens with that judge. The judge named Samson. It's a lot, a lot, a lot in that story. And then uh, we'll be going into chapter one. Of the uh, spiritual warfare that shattered demonic altars. And how whole witchcraft book. We'll be looking at the reality of spiritual warfare. Okay. So. This um. Book is going to expose a lot of things to you. The things you may not have known. Or may not have really known about. Maybe not have heard of before. But God is telling us. It's time for us to move. From the milk of the word. Until, and into the meat and potatoes. Of the word. So we're going to look at the reality. Of spiritual warfare. And we're going to also continue praying. The psalm. So tomorrow we'll pray psalm. 103 as well so our next video so i love you all be blessed i pray this word is a blessing unto you please feel free to like share or comment please feel free to uh subscribe to this channel we're at 82 subscribers let's go to 100 and let god lead us from there so this word is a blessing to you. Share it with somebody else. And let's learn warfare. Let's go into everything God says we're supposed to be doing. So I love you all. Be blessed. Continue to grow in God. Continue to grow in the word. Continue to grow in your faith. Let's see our faith increase. And let's see our faith manifested in this world. I love you all. Be blessed. This is Faith Manifested with Andrea. Have a blessed day.